The story is called Pa's Car. It was August of 1969. I had just graduated from Niagara Falls High School that June and was two weeks away from leaving for college on the prairies of Kansas. Pa, I said, can I borrow the new car to go to a concert? The new car? Are you nuts? I guess, he said, but you have to take your little brother with you. Your mother and I are going out. We'll use the old car, but be damn careful. The new car was a four-door 1968 Pontiac Catalina. 400 cubic inch eight-cylinder engine, 4.12 inch bore and a 3.75 inch stroke. It produced 290 horsepower and 428 foot-pounds of torque. It was cream colored, cloth seats with leather trim, AM FM radio and an eight track player, simulated wood grain dash and electric door locks. It was the car of Pa's dreams. He had watched the window at Kruger Pontiac in Niagara Falls for a year. It was a salesman's demo with low mileage. And when the 1969 version came out, he made them an offer on the demo and we had our first new car since the 1962 Chevy Impala. He waxed it the first day we had it home. And when I asked to borrow the new car, it had been home for just two weeks. I called the boys to let them know that the road trip was on, but we had to bring Mark along. We left that afternoon, Thursday, August 14th. My kid brother, Mark, was 15 years old. Mark and I made the rounds picking up the boys. There was Dangler, Acorn, Pigpen, Little Mike, and Louis Sawicki. For some reason, Louis never had a nickname. He was always referred to by his full name. He was always Louis Sawicki. Seven of us in Pa's new Pontiac Catalina. The first morning Friday, we woke to the rafts of smoke, breakfast being cooked on Coleman camping stoves that smarter people brought along, the sound of the Grateful Dead blaring from a car stereo system, and the sun beginning to burn off the damp of the hill's grasses. It took only a few minutes to understand that this was all going to be very different. We never asked for food. It was gladly offered. Wine with eggs and bacon, Pipes passed around, guitars everywhere, and Mark, mouth wide open, hardly believing what he was seeing, he, after all, was my 15-year-old kid brother. The concert was scheduled to begin at noon. Somewhere along the path from our hill to the stage, we were handed plastic jugs of water. It's going to be hot, man, a young woman said. You'll want this, and she danced away to some song in her own head. By 10 a.m., we had etched out our space, no more than 150 yards from the stage, dead center, so we'd get the best sound possible. Noon was coming. It came and it went. For nearly four hours, we sat baking in the sun of day one. It was the only time the ground was solid, no mud and no rain, and at noon, no music either. At 3.30, Mark said he needed a bathroom. We pointed to the rows of Porta Johns 100 yards away to the left of the stage. As he began to leave, he asked, how will I find you guys? Just walk back to the center of the stage, down front, and when we see you, we'll stand up and wave, and you can just walk through the crowd to get to us. OK, he said. It was estimated that eventually some 500,000 people attended the festival. On Friday afternoon, day one, there were probably about 100,000 people but they never stopped coming. Mark trudged back to the center of the stage in front of the fencing meant to keep the performers safe from the crowd, and Dangler saw him first. There's the kid, he said, and we all stood up to wave our arms and shout his name, and as we did, 100,000 people stood as well, shouting and waving their arms. <laughs> At that very moment, Richie Havens walked out on stage and began to play. The concert was officially underway, four hours late, and we didn't see Mark for three days. <laughs> At the 20th anniversary of Woodstock, the Niagara Gazette published an article complete with pictures, interviewing my crew about our experiences. Even then, Mark wouldn't elaborate on what happened, what he saw, or what he did, except to say those three days were like nothing else before or since. The music was incredible. The rain was unbelievable, the mud was everywhere, the experience was second to none. 
but I can't stop to tell you about all that now. This is, after all, a story about Pa's car. On Monday morning, we listened to Hendrix play the Star Spangled Banner. Mark found us, finally, and we walked the concert site for the better part of two hours. There were tons of garbage, clothes, sleeping bags, bottles, and people mud-covered and left behind. The emergency tents were full of bad trips and minor injuries. Everywhere were people asking, which way were you going? Could they get a ride to the throughway? Did you have any spare change? Because we had arrived the night before it all began, we were unable to leave until Monday about 1 p.m. The hundreds of cars surrounding the 1968 Pontiac Catalina were bogged down, everyone helping to push each other's car down the hill toward the road, wheel wells caked with mud. Mark was the lightest and smallest. We made him drive while we pushed Pa's car down the incline from the top of the hill. Halfway down, the car began to slip sideways. It skipped over the mud like we all had, down the mudslide on an afternoon, turning the rain into a tool and the mud into a playground. It came to a stop 100 feet or so from the bottom of the hill and the paved road below that. At least a dozen other people joined in to help us right the car and point it back toward the road. At the bottom of the hill was a VW bug, sitting and waiting, it seemed, for the very point of that 1968 Pontiac Catalina. Na, 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 it seemed to say. It was covered with painted flowers and peace signs adorning the entire car, and Pa's new Pontiac Catalina was pointed in its direction. As Mark hit the gas, the car headed toward the road. It began to slide down the hill, aided by the push of a dozen strangers. As it reached the road, half skidding and half gassed, the inevitable happened. Mark T-boned the VW. Coming to a dead stop, our rear tires still stuck at the bottom of the hill in the mud. Others joined us as we picked up the VW and moved it to the side. Then finishing the push, Mark pulled out on the road and we all jumped into Pa's car. As I began to drive away, Mark shouted, stop, I have to leave a note. And he reached in the glove box, pulled out a scrap of paper and pencil and walked back to the VW. He stood looking at us for a minute and on what remained of the hood of the Volkswagen, wrote his note, placing it under the windshield wiper. 20 miles or so down the road, little Mike said, Mark, I guess you learned a lot about peace and love this weekend. It was nice of you to leave that note with all your information for that VW owner. Mark smiled the same smile he still smiles when you know he feels he's just a step ahead of you. He looked at little Mike in the back seat and said, I didn't leave my contact information. I wrote, there are 10,000 people watching me write this note thinking I'm leaving my name and number. Well, I'm not, peace. <laughs> it took me two weeks to get all that mud out from Pa's car. He made me wax it every weekend for a month and I was never allowed to drive it again. The boys scattered a few weeks later for various colleges and universities across the country. Mark retired from the city of Niagara Falls a couple years ago after 30 years as a water quality engineer. And I've spent most of my professional career in urban development. I still play a little music now and then. I own a VW Bug convertible and a restored 1971 VW bus. And I think about that weekend often proud to have been there when history was made, and just as proud that the guys in the bandlon shirts, pointy black shoes, and sands belt pants were wrong. Sometimes, when you look into your eyes, you just don't have to worry about what you'll find. Thank you. Me. <laughs> and that's Andy. Thank you all and have a great conference.